Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to the session on the future of utilities. My name is Martin Dröpe. I'm from the German Ministry of Economic Affairs and Energy, leading the International Energy Policy Division. And it's my pleasure to lead you this afternoon to this panel with the excellent panelists that we have here in front of you. Um, what is the topic about? And let me start perhaps in introducing this with four observations. One is that traditionally a utility was a one-stop shop in taking care of generation, transmission and distribution. And a couple of countries have started unbundling, unbundling their sector in a sense that the transmission portion as a natural monopoly has been separated from generation and distribution. And if that is done in a proper way, it's called a liberalized energy market. Second observation is that, and, and we don't talk about grids this afternoon, it's about the generation and distribution, so the real competition and commercial elements of the power market of the utilities. Second observation, new technologies, small scale technologies have introduced new possibilities, formerly Utilities had a big centralized model of big power plants serving unidirectionally from the generation to the customer. With new modular technologies like wind, like solar, but also like small hydro or small bioenergy, consumers can become producers, and this leads to the new world of a prosumer. Third, the um, digitalization has even brought up new possibilities. Could we imagine a Uber for electricity? Can we imagine smart homes where we manage our home with our smartphone? So these are elements that just in a nutshell show the transition of a typical utility from a one-stop sh shop entity serving unilaterally to a new world where production and consumption moves much closer together and where digitalization will even offer new business models and entrance into the markets. I would like to discuss these questions around this with the panelists here. We have one setting the scene presentation from my dear colleague Georgina Grenon. She has been serving for a while for the French Ministry for Energy, thereby also serving with in IEA where we met a couple of years ago. But since then, she moved to the private sector and is today working for NG. So I think you are very well positioned to show us the development as representatives now from NG, a traditional uh, utility, how NG takes this challenge ahead. Please, Georgina, you have 50 minutes setting the scene presentation. Uh, th thank you very much. Uh, thank you, Martin. It's uh, always a pleasure to see you. Uh, and it's, uh, it's a great pleasure to be here today. I'd like to start by thanking as well uh, the organizers for, for the invitation, you know, REN21 and also the, the Ministry of Energy of Mexico. Um, let me start by saying that today we're not going to be talking about the future of utilities. We're going to be talking about the present of utilities because the, the future is now. And if I can... Uh, for those who don't know NG, NG, we're a you know, big utility, multinational, present in 70 countries, 150,000 employees around the world focusing largely on generation, uh, distribution networks, and services. Um, NG as a company has decided to um, basically un un upload, um, download all the uh, old uh, production assets based on coal, for example, just to focus on proper, you know, and clean energy generation. That means, in real terms, 20 billion euros, for example, divested recently and being redeployed in cleaner energies. Um, why is that? Believe that the 3D, you know, the, what, uh, what Martin was saying, the 3D revolution is actually changing everything we're doing is affecting our everyday, as we are becoming decentralized, we are becoming digitalized, uh, we are becoming decarbonized. 
um, all these impressive changes and generating new opportunities for disruptive business models, and this is a bit of what I'm going to share today with you. Um, let me start with a picture. I mean, some of you may have seen this before. Um, you know, we believe that technology changes happen gradually. We think that they're incremental. You know, things are going to happen at a certain pace. We don't necessarily realize that sometimes the changes are very fast. And this is an example. I mean, if you see this, this was New York in the in 1900. You know, I invite you to find um, a car there. And everything you see is a horse, are horses, right? And, and that was a problem. Of course, you know, horses were a problem in, in such a complicated city. Um, and, um, but in the picture, you can see a car. One, just one, right? Uh, only 13 years later, this is how New York looked like. 13 years, just that, right? No more horses. Well, actually, you can find one horse in that picture. Right. And this is what we believe is happening right now with energy. Changes are dramatic, right? And like in these two pictures, everything is to be reinvented. In 13 years that separate those two pictures, regulation was put in place, a whole industry move, you know, grew up. Business were destroyed and no business emerged. And this is what is happening now. You know, huge opportunities for utilities to reinvent themselves, but at the same time, huge challenges for the, the assets they have and the, and the business as usual basis. Right. Where are those changes coming from? You know, we believe there are five main technology revolutions that are driving this massive change. The first one is, of course, renewables, and this is what, why we're here, right? It's massive access to renewable energy that is affordable. But then you're gonna say, yeah, fine. And renewable energy is affordable, it's cheap, basically, uh, in many, many countries. Um, but it's variable, right? And then how, how do we deal with that? Well, batteries, storage. The prices of storage is coming down at a you know, very, very fast pace. So renewables, accessible, and dispatchable is actually what we want. It is what we are getting right now. So that coupled with electric mobility, you know, everything you've seen so far about electric mobility is nothing compared to what you're going to see in the next year, next two years. You're seeing pledges from countries, from cities, you know, to impose regulation on electric mobility. But that is, at the end of the day, well, if you're imposed by a regulation, you may end up doing, right? But what is important is that it's going to become cheap. Electric cars are going to become cheaper than any other way of mobility. Shared electric cars are going to become comfortable, cheap, accessible to everyone. That's going to change the way you know, we see transportation. And for a utility, that's also an opportunity because this is going to create massive, you know, massive growth of electricity demand. The Internet of Things, the ability to communicate with the objects inside your home the ability to program where and, and where to have the demand of your electricity, of your energy consumption, uh, and having the ability to compose the, the demand with the dispatch, you know, with, with when the generation of the electricity is happening. That is something that we couldn't really do until now, and, and now we have the tools, we have the software, we, you know, we have the ways of, of making that match happen. And, and communicating all those, you know, distributed energy resources, as it is, uh, you know, technically called, uh, that is allowing us to generate new business opportunities as well. And last but certainly not least, hydrogen is, is the fifth, you know, big revolution that we see. Because um, we believe in, in, in a future that is not so far away, we're going to be able to produce massively hydrogen at prices that are going to be competitive with natural gas, basically. So if you can produce green hydrogen and, and at a price, you know, become a, an energy vector, not just a gimmick, you know, not just a little thing for transportation, but a real serious energy vector, then that's a very massive cha uh, game changer. So 
with all these revolutions in mind, Angie has basically created a group of people that is, is working on, on developing solutions around this, and, and this is part of the team I'm working on. Um, so all of those solutions, you know, having dispatchable renewables, having energy communities, having green mobility, are very interesting by themselves, but things become very, very, very interesting when you put them all together and you create what we call the 100% renewable solutions. That is, being able to supply energy that is entirely renewable for a city, for a neighborhood, country, and for companies as well. And this is very interesting because companies are getting into the idea of themselves independently of other reasons, um, becoming pioneers of the 100% renewable solution. Um, how do you compose a 100% renewable solution? Well, basically you need to look for what's available, where you are, which sort of mix makes sense, with, that is competitive enough, which sort of storage you know, solution to make it dispatchable at an accessible price, how to transfer uh, mobility from its current state into, into you know, green electric mobility, and make sure you, you can secure the supply, because obviously if not, uh, you know, people are not gonna be happy. Um, hydrogen can be a solution as well for storage, you know, as an energy vector, as I said, and all that faced over time you can say, well, you know, in some places now, because we're doing it now, for example, in the south of France, in other places in the near future, we're going to be able to compose solutions like this uh, and, and actually have areas at 100% renewable uh, energy or at least electricity first and then, and then full energy uh, in conditions that are competitive, you know, if not cheaper, than the current supply. So, in sum, the message today is that, as I said, there are huge opportunities, but huge challenges as well. So it all depends on where you sit. Um, the renewables, you know, dispatchable renewables are proposing or offering a solution that is more and more competitive, if not already less expensive than the current solutions and having the, the possibility of securing the price of energy over time. So for example, we see industrial customers saying, you know what, I'm interested in what you're offering, not just because it's green, actually the green is the plus, but because you can tell me with, you know, precisely how much I'm gonna pay for my electricity for the next 20 years. And that is very hard to say and do for other sources of energy then, as I said, the, the possibility of having massive access to electric mobility at competitive prices, the possibility of connecting all those elements, you know, making energy dispatchable, managing the demand, providing interconnectivity into the, all those elements and, uh, and creating opportunities to new services, you know, both for, I would say, residential customers, for commercial, for industrial customers. Um, the fact that citizens are becoming more and more interested in uh, being actors, being active in the decision of what they consume, how they consume, when they consume it, right? That's very important change as well. So the emergence of uh, energy communities, as we call it, um, it's not, again, it's, it's not a future, it's, it's today, right? And you can see places in Germany, in California, where this is actually happening, right? Um, then, of course, as I said, hydrogen has the potential to become not just a transportation solution, but certainly a, a big, big change in the way we see utilities today. So all that to say, you know, you may see um, a lot about you know, 100% uh, renewable solutions. Um, you may see a lot about uh, when this may happen, you know, is this true, is this feasible? It is happening, and the interest is growing by the hour. So, again, um, I hope this uh, was a you know, light, light introduction of, uh, as I said, not the future, but our present, and, and hopefully the present of, of many of us here today. Thank you very much for your attention and happy to take questions in English or in Spanish. Thanks.
Thank you, Georgina, for this introduction, setting the scene. You brought up a number of very interesting new developments, and I will come back to this later during the discussion. Let us start, perhaps, with a look to the Mexican situation, as we are in Mexico here. Um, Mexico is undergoing a deep transformation of its energy sector, liberalization, and opening markets for new investments. We have with us Mr. Hector Olea. He has a huge experience in the entire section of energy here in Mexico. Um, he has served as the chairman of the regulatory commission and is in these days the president of the Solar Energy Association. How does the situation look like in Mexico? What are your predictions for the utility market in Mexico, given that we still have a big monopoly institution? But also, what are the prospects for new market entrants, for competition in that market? Please, Hector. Thank you, Martin. Thank you very much for the introduction. Thank you also to the Energy Secretary for, for the invitation of this very important event. Let me, let me turn to, to Spanish. So uh, I see a lot of uh, Spanish speakers uh, already here, so I think uh, it will benefit from uh, uh, my talk in Spanish. Como decía eh, in la introducción, y como nos relataba Georgina muy, eh, con palabras muy, muy claras, muy sencillas de entender, el futuro está aquí, el futuro es, es ahora. Ya no estamos hablando de lo que puede pasar en, en los próximos 20 años de la ciencia ficción, de dónde van a quedar las utilities, las, estas, estas empresas verticalmente integradas, que ya siento son eh, una historia del pasado. Pero quisiera enfocarme a un problema muy particular a México en cuanto al futuro de esta empresa del Estado, este CFE, eh, muy particular a lo que ya está pasando y en los próximos años se, eh, eh, será aún, aún más, se acelerará, acelerará este proceso. Y me refiero mucho a que, cuál va a ser el futuro de CFE ante esta disrupción de mercados esta disrupción de nuevas te tecnologías que estamos viendo actualmente, particularmente a CFE. En un país donde el 85% de la, del territorio tiene condiciones óptimas de generación de energía solar fotovoltaica. Y eso es muy característico de México. Pocos países pueden tener a lo largo y a lo ancho las posibilidades de prácticamente en todo su territorio nacional tener condiciones óptimas de generación de energía solar fotovoltaica. Esa particularidad aunada a la reducción en costo que hemos, ve, que hemos visto en los últimos cinco años en cuanto a la tecnología solar fotovoltaica se refiere, 75 de reducción de costos se han observado en los últimos cinco años con relación a la construcción de eh, centrales eléctricas fotovoltaicas, de soluciones fotovoltaicas. Esa reducción en costos no la habíamos visto hace mucho desde eh, en las computadoras eh, eh, personales, probablemente desde los celulares. Esa es la primera gran disrupción en el mercado que estamos viendo en materia prácticamente de las energías renovables. Pero hay una segunda disrupción que está empezando ahora, pero que se profundizará en los próximos dos años. En los próximos dos años, la tecnología de almacenamiento de energía en baterías, como litio, por ejemplo, baterías de litio, serán ya comercialmente viables para el público en general. Esa es una segunda disrupción, una segunda ola de disrupción que va a afectar la forma de hacer negocios en el mundo, pero particularmente en México, da las, las condiciones de recurso solar que tenemos en este país. Entonces, una reducción en costos de la tecnología solar, una muy pronta reducción a nivel comercial del precio de las baterías y un recurso solar prácticamente en todo territorio nacional. Esa combinación va a hacer que las empresas, los comercios, las industrias, los parques industriales estén considerando soluciones de almacenamiento de energía y soluciones 
de generación solar fotovoltaica. Y probablemente no las soluciones de, de baterías que se estén pensando de aquí a dos años necesariamente eviten la intermitencia de la, de la, del recurso solar. No necesariamente va por ahí la solución, sino ese almacenamiento servirá para abatir el consumo de energía en hora pico, cualquiera que ésta se defina, porque habrá cambios. Actualmente la hora pico son dos horas en la noche de 8 a 10, en términos muy generales. En el futuro esto podrá cambiar. Pero lo que es importante es que estas empresas, estos usuarios comerciales e industriales, que pueden muy fácilmente colocar una solución solar fotovoltaica en sus techos, en los terrenos adyacentes, en sus estacionamientos, podrán incorporar soluciones de almacenamiento para abatir exclusivamente, hacer un peak shaving de la energía, de la energía en pico, del consumo de energía en pico. Y eso además de que contrarresta un costo importante, porque la energía en pico, obviamente aquí en México al menos, tiene un costo de unos 300% sobre la, la energía base o intermedia, lo importante es que se va a evitar de manera muy significativa el pago de la demanda facturable, de los capacity charge, ¿sí? al no registrar consumo en la hora pico, la demanda facturable, de acuerdo a las fórmulas eh, eh, actuales y que probablemente se trasladen al futuro, no, estará, no estarán asumiendo el costo de la capacidad, de la demanda que se tiene contratada. Pues habrá un pick shaving con baterías. Entonces, esta solución que yo veo muy económicamente viable para los usuarios comerciales e industriales, representará un enorme problema para CFE, para el utility mexicano. ¿Quién pagará la demanda? ¿Quién pagará la capacidad instalada si los principales usuarios industriales y comerciales están evitando ese pago a través de sistemas de almacenamiento. ¿Dónde quedarán los grandes usuarios que son los que hay un cross-subsidy eh, eh, cross hacia los usuarios residenciales? ¿Sí? Están subsidiando de alguna forma los usuarios comerciales e industriales, aquellos in, eh, residenciales. ¿Cómo se balanceará ese subsidio hacia usuarios residenciales? Porque, obviamente, muchos de estos usuarios industriales y comerciales tratarán de evitar precisamente la participación eh, en, en el mercado regulado o incluso en el mercado eléctrico mayorista. Esto va a representar un problema importante de estrés sobre las finanzas ya de por sí delicadas de nuestra empresa estatal en materia de, de, de electricidad. ¿Cómo hará frente CFE a estos retos tecnológicos y comerciales que vienen, no en el futuro, insisto, sino en los próximos meses, los próximos dos años? Es algo que todavía no queda claro y que seguramente nuestras autoridades estarán, estarán eh, eh, planeando, estarán analizando. Pero el financiamiento de la infraestructura eléctrica en este país, como en cualquier otro país, viene de los grandes clientes industriales, viene del pago de, la de, del pago de la capacidad y eso con estas nuevas tecnologías no necesariamente lo vamos a ver. ¿Cuál va a ser estas oportunidades que se están dando, sí para la iniciativa privada en los usuarios, usuarios, usuarios comerciales e industriales y cuáles van a ser los retos que esas soluciones van a imponer sobre el futuro de nuestra empresa eléctrica? Es algo que todavía desconozco, desconocemos algunos de nosotros. Sin duda, vienen tiempos importantes, vienen tiempos de gran disrupción y estamos muy interesados en ver cómo se van a resolver. Muchas gracias por su atención. Thank you very much, Hector. Just allow me one additional question to what you lined out. You said there could be the possibility of uh, more installed storage capacity that may be then a purely economic decision of the produce of the consumer, either to buy power from the grid or to produce on its own and store it. Is that 
already economic, uh, legally feasible here in Mexico, or do you need a, a change in legislation or norms in order to make that a business case? Efectivamente, esta solución ya es legal. La reforma energética ha abierto esos canales de competencia, esos canales de flexibilidad para que usuarios industriales, residenciales, de alto consumo, comerciales, puedan acceder a estos nuevos mecanismos, ya sea a través de esquemas de net metering, por abajo de medio megawatt, o por arriba de medio megawatt, esquemas de lo que llamamos nosotros abasto aislado. Entonces, eso ya está siendo regulado por la Comisión Reguladora de Energía y eh, el problema es que todavía no es económicamente viable. En las soluciones de almacenamiento en, en el, la mayor parte del país actualmente no son viables. Ya lo están siendo para Baja California Sur, que es un, que es un, eh, eh, un sistema aislado y que los costos de energía son altos vis a vis el costo actual de las, de las baterías pero eso lo vamos a ver en los próximos años, también replicado en el resto del país. Thank you for this additional explanation. Mexico is also famous for its uh, auctioning or tendering schemes, um, having auctioned capacity and having got awards to mostly more than 90% to renewable technologies. One of the big winners of those awards was the Italian company Enel. And we have with us here Gerardo Cervantes. And I would like to ask him how he, from his point of view, as a new market entrant here in Mexico, being an independent power producer, how you see the market in Mexico. And if you can also, like, you can compare it to the German system, but not the, sorry, the, the European system, as you are initially an Italian company. Gerardo, please. Thank you very much for the opportunity as well. Same as Hector, if you don't mind, I will change to Spanish for the, uh, for the sake of the majority of the audience. Um, primero, para quienes no estén muy familiarizados dentro de la audiencia con el Grupo Enel, una muy breve descripción de quiénes somos nosotros. Somos una de las cinco empresas utilities eléctricas más grandes del mundo. Actualmente tenemos algo como 65 millones de usuarios de los cuales 15 millones son usuarios de libre mercado. Ese es un tema muy importante que yo creo que en algún momento de la, de la conversación tendrá, tendrá lugar. Eh, nuestra capacidad de generación en el mundo es aproximadamente 15% más grande que todo lo que tiene México instalado y tenemos tanto como dos veces y media más redes de distribución y transmisión que de lo que tiene actualmente México instalado también. Eh, uno de los valores principales que tiene nuestra empresa, desde hace tres años, adelantándose a todo esto que, que, que explicaba nuestra keynote speaker amablemente, eh, fue esta approach, esta cultura, esta filosofía del open power. Y ahora lo, lo vinculo con la, pregunta que me, con la pregunta que me hacen. ¿Por qué resulta importante? Porque coincidimos en que el futuro es ahora, yo creo que es algo en lo que ya estamos de acuerdo todos, con que las empresas eléctricas tienen tienen que formar una serie de habilidades que les permitan responder al dinamismo que tienen los mercados actualmente. ¿Por qué, por qué digo esto? Eh, ¿Qué es lo que pasa, por ejemplo, y ahora vinculándolo con la, pregunta que, con la pregunta que me haces? ¿Cómo vemos nosotros el mercado mexicano siendo una empresa de las más prominentes en Europa, entrando al mercado de renovables en México? Eh, vemos que va rápido, justamente. Vemos que hay todos los medios. Vemos que la evolución es muy evidente entre la primera, la segunda y será aún más en la tercera subasta. Vemos un producto que se está comoditizando, porque las renovables, toda, toda la inversión en energía limpia, todo lo que es generación de energía limpia, es algo que no es, eh, no, no, no es la energía no convencional, es la energía más convencional que hay ahora mismo. Tiene 20 años desarrollándose y está ahora mismo en su, en su clímax eh, de desarrollo tecnológico. Entonces, ¿qué es lo que vemos que va a seguir pasando en México? ¿Qué es lo que vemos como una utility europea en México en torno a la generación de energías limpias, al mecanismo de subastas, que se va a seguir comoditizando? Los márgenes cada vez van a ser más pequeños, más pequeños. Es muy probable que entren en etapas de consolidación. ¿Por qué? Porque ahora mismo lo que demanda el usuario, lo que demandan los clientes, que es el enfoque principal del grupo en el ahora mismo, digitalización y clientes, es que tengamos la capacidad de responder 
a la velocidad a la que ellos están acostumbrados a consumir cualquier cosa. Esto es muy importante entenderlo. La, la, la energía, el mundo de la energía, particularmente la energía eléctrica, tradicionalmente eh, 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 en el pasado estaba regido por monopolios naturales, ¿no? empresas estatales, gigantes y, y por tanto era visto como un servicio público bastante, bastante plano, ¿no? en el que no había mucho por hacer. Ahora mismo las nuevas generaciones, todas estas generaciones millennials y postmillennials, están acostumbradas a demandar y a formar parte, a ser prosumers, a formar parte del ciclo económico de cualquier cosa que, produzca, que se produzca y cualquier cosa que demanden. Las empresas eléctricas no estaremos exentas de eso. Ahora mismo, eh, compañías como el grupo Enel llevan preparándose, llevamos preparándonos bastantes años, justamente para poder responder al hecho de que nuestros clientes, en cualquier producto que demanden, incluida la energía eléctrica, quieren participar. Debemos de ser capaces de proveerles plataformas que les permitan participar. Por ejemplo, en temas como movilidad eléctrica o digitalización del consumo, del consumo residencial. O sea, al final de cuentas hay que entender, por ejemplo, que el gran disruptor que va a producir la movilidad eléctrica es que son generadores atomizados y consumidores atomizados que se están moviendo por toda una red y que no requieren necesariamente el mismo tipo de infraestructura de transmisión y cuyo reto principal va a ser entender cómo funciona su dinámica de consumo y cómo funciona su dinámica de generación y eso es esencialmente digital. Son esencialmente modelos, son esencialmente algoritmos, son esencialmente plataformas digitales. Ese es el tipo de, de, el tipo de servicio del futuro de las, de las compañías utilities como el Grupo Enel. Entender justamente esas, esas dinámicas de consumo, esas nuevas dinámicas de generación, que no, no únicamente van a tener que ver con la capacidad de una, de una renovable de ser despachable, es que no es en realidad ese el, 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 punto, el punto álgido, el punto complejo. Tiene que ver con que la propia dinámica de la demanda va a cambiar. ¿Por qué? Porque el consumidor quiere tomar decisiones de cómo quiere consumir la energía, porque la movilidad eléctrica es en parte también eso. Entonces, ¿qué vemos nosotros, eh, para, ¿qué, qué vemos nosotros como empresa europea llegada a México? Que justamente esas dinámicas, esa necesidad del cliente es la misma ya que acá, con lo cual no hace diferencia el mercado en el que te encuentres. Y las mismas habilidades que hemos venido desarrollando en los mercados desarrollados, para poder atender estas nuevas dinámicas de mercado, son las mismas que aplicaremos acá y, y, y creemos que aquí la oportunidad de, de, de negocio en torno a todos estos nuevos mecanismos, a todas estas nuevas plataformas es enorme. Rauro, thank you very much. Thank you very much, Gerardo. Let's turn to the United States, the next neighbor here to Mexico. With us is Lawrence Jones. Um, he's from the Edison Electric Institute that represents all U.S. investor-owned electric companies. Given the diversity of the 52 states in the U.S. and the system varying from each state to the other, how do you, how do your members see the role, the function of utility today and evolving in the future? Opening markets, having new market entrance competition in terms of renewables production. Lawrence, please. Good afternoon. Uh, that's much better. All right. Uh, first of all, thank you again for inviting me, and uh, thanks to the organizer of this event. Um, what I'd like to do is, uh, obviously, the question was specifically about the U.S. in terms of having 52 states or and having our members spread across the U.S., I run the international program in, at EEI, and that program has over 70 members in about 92 countries. And so when I look at the issue of utility transformation and looking at utility of the future, and I look at the various business models, I, I try to look at it from two contexts. And I think there's something to bear in mind. Um, first of all, is that this issue of the transition, the transformation of the utility sector is obviously global in scope. Everyone is talking about it, right? Everywhere you go, you hear utility of the future. I've seen, I've seen so many reports on utility of the future, I sometimes wonder if I need to see another one. Um, because everyone is trying to speculate uh, what the future is supposed to look like. But what's interesting is that wherever I travel, when I talk to utilities around the world, what's very interesting is that although the transition is global in, con in, in scope, in essence, it's local in character. And by that I mean there is no one size fits all. 
And that is very important to understand because when you talk about the utility of the future, you need to th step back and ask yourself the question, is that utility going to be in the United States? Is it going to be in India? Is it going to be in Mexico? Is it going to be in Africa? And wherever you go, there are local conditions that will determine the shape of what that future is going to look like. And there is a tendency, oftentimes, when we talk about the utility of the future, is that we want to come up with some sort of a generic model that we would like to sort of a project down to different countries and make that the, ability, the applicable solution. So even in the U.S., where we have varying states and we have different regulatory frameworks, uh, different uh, utilities are exploring different things. We have utilities that are exploring uh, some of what uh, some of the speakers have already talked about. Uh, we have utilities that are operating on the wholesale utility markets, or what others refer to as liberalized markets. But you have those who are operating under vertically integrated utilities. Now, I think what's very important for us to keep in mind as we have this conversation uh, is that it's something I observed uh, about three years ago. I, I did a book on renewable energy integration where I basically travel around the world and I surveyed utilities about integrating renewables. And they all had different approaches to how they were going about doing it. But one thing that was common is that we have to step back and ask ourselves, what is the role of the utility? Uh, you ask the question, are we going to have an Uber-like uh, uh, equivalent of utility? Well, let's remember that in essence, Uber, to some extent, and even Facebook, is actually centralization. People don't think about it. What Uber does is it actually centralizes the ability to get access to transportation. Facebook centralizes the ability to get access to your friends. Uh, Google centralizes the ability to information. Now, for those who say they want to go down that route, basically what you're saying is that we should have a utility model where you have one gigantic utility that runs the world. So I don't think the idea of having an Uber-like version of the utility is something that I see in the future. I don't see it in the future for, for a number of reasons. First of all, if we see what's happening today in Florida, or what happened in Texas, or what happened here in Mexico, at the end of the day, delivering electricity to customers is fundamentally an infrastructure business. Whether we like it or not, I've always said that as we look at this transformation and where the utilities are going, we have to keep in mind that in terms of large mega cities like Bombay, like Delhi, like Paris, there is no way we are going to be able to supply electricity to the consumers by just using distributed generation. So at the end of the day, I think the model for the future is going to be a hybrid model, a model that embraces some level of distributedness. But I think given the vast majority of citizens, the fact that they will be living in cities where you have high rises, where today, for example, in Washington, D.C., you cannot even find the land to build a microgrid or a solar system that's supposed to be distributed, where are you going to put those systems? So if you have everybody living in high rises in those large mega cities, where do you put the distributed resources? So the issue of the utility of the future has to be really thought of very carefully. And we need to not just look at what it means from a utility perspective or what it means from a developer perspective, but we need to think about the utility of the future in terms of what does it mean for the consumer? What we don't want to do is to create the utility of the future where only maybe 10% of the consumers really benefit from this new future, but yet and still the majority of the citizens in those countries really cannot take advantage of all of this transformation we're talking about. Because at the end of the day, if you think of what's happening in Florida today with the restoration that's going on, the folks who are on the ground, who are required to make sure that resilience is brought back, the system is brought back up, are the utilities. And so I got up this morning and I was thinking, what if the state of Florida had only distributed energy resources? What if everything was renewable? How would you rebuild the system? How would you bring it back up? And I think one of the challenges we have as an industry, talking about renewables, is that sometimes we tend to forget that at the end of the day, renewables should not just be for a small percentage of the population. Resilience is not just about having resilience for those who can afford to buy electric vehicles. It has to be for the average person in these countries. Because let's remember, the utilities were created as a mechanism for governments to be able to provide resources for their citizens. 
And if we were to say we should decentralize, yes, I think it's great. I think these new business models are important. But what happens to the average person in cities who cannot afford to, to be connected to these distributed resources? And if we were to distribute, you know, come up with distributed solutions, I've heard discussions about blockchain technology. I think it's a very good thing to talk about blockchain. But if you have blockchain technology, what is the physical um, obligation that if I have a blockchain transaction with him and I cannot deliver the physical electricity to him, who is on the hook to provide that electricity? And every time you have these discussions, it goes back to saying the utilities. So I think we need to be very, very careful when we talk about the utility of the future in generic terms. I think we have to localize it, whether you're in New Zealand, whether you're in Australia, whether you're in the US, France, Germany, we have to think in terms of what is the purpose of a utility. Now, I agree with those who may say, let's you know, disrupt the utility model. Fine, let's do it. But bear in mind, if you do it, in some countries you have 10, 15, 20 million people who benefit on a utility model that assumes that not everyone has the ability to pay. So the regulatory model is very key in how this transformation occurs. Yes, we should think about what is happening in terms of Facebook and Google and those business models, but let's remember, electricity still requires wires, it still requires bushings, it still requires substations, whether it's a microgrid, you still need a wire to connect somebody. So until we have wireless electricity transmission, we'll need physics. And because we need the physical network, I would say that all of the models we're exploring are, are great, but they should not be discussed in the context with forgetting that we need a physical infrastructure. And, and until we do that, my fear is that the future will be very, very sort of a disorganized because you will have those wanting to disrupt the utility business model, but nobody wanting to pay for the infrastructure. And at the end of the day, who will suffer? The, the poor customers in many communities. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Lawrence. Um, just to get one question right, um, I think nobody in the room uh, contradicts that we have to need physical infrastructure, physical production, and then responsibility if it is not delivered. But what Uber did is to disconnect physical supply of cars and drivers from the service that you can book, be it centralized or per country. So the question I put in the beginning is, can you imagine in the power sector, in utility sector, to disconnect physical production and delivery from the service of a client to get to the internet and book 1,000 kilowatt hours for three months? Is that possible or not? Do you want to respond directly to this? Sure, I, I love to respond to that. Uh, I have a lot of friends at Uber and we have this conversation all the time. You're right. Dis Take Google or Uber, whatever you want. Uber, Google. Well, dislocation, this occur, and we see this intermediation occurring. But at the end of the day, even if you try to do that, the physical infrastructure has to be paid for. And so the utility business model, if you say, fine, let's do the dislocation, I'm always for that. But if someone is still going to use the infrastructure to deliver electricity, the cost of that infrastructure has to be paid for. Of course. And what has happened, imagine in the case of Uber, the roads that Uber drives on were paid for by us. We paid for it. We paid for that infrastructure through our taxes. Now, if you're saying that when we do the dislocation, everyone in this room should pay additional taxes for CFE to maintain the infrastructure, then that's a different issue. So it comes down to the regulatory model and the business model. Who pays for the infrastructure? And what does this disruption do to the utilities revenue stream? Because remember, when the physical investments were made, the agreement with the regulators and the utilities was that this is a 40-year investment I'm making to keep the lights on. I'm all for disruption, but when you do the disruption, who pays for maintaining the grid? I think we can continue this for a while, but as we have other panelists here, let's first listen to them. Let's switch from the Americas to Asia, and more precisely to China. With us is Mr. Yundan Wong, the chairman of Shanghai Electric Power. He has, as well, a long distance, long uh, time history in energy sector, 
And so I invite you to present us the situation in China. What is there the role function today and the future of, of utility? How do you see that sector evolving in China? Knowing that China also is going towards the liberalization of the market, you will express yourself in Chinese. We don't have a Chinese interpretation here, but we have with him a lady who ensures English interpretation. Please. Um, that, uh, very thank you for the invitation. Also, very thank you for the previous two speakers' presentation. These are very valuable to our work. Okay. Thank you very much for the invitation. I'm very glad to be here, and thank you, thank everyone, like the. Uh, specialists, they are excellent uh, insights. They are all very insightful for our future work. Shanghai Shanghai Electric Power Company has a history of 135 years. But for recent years, my biggest feeling is change. More faster and faster change. Uh,改变来自于技术的进步，改变来自于观念和数据化。The those changes come from the progress of the technology, and those changes come from the changes of the concepts and ideas. 以电为例。For example,嗯，那个二零一四年，我们做了一笔交易。是在欧洲欧盟的一个岛国马尔他。嗯，use，呃，taking for example, in 2014, we made a transaction in one of the island country in Europe, Malta. 嗯，当时一四年我们交易的时候，答应了一件事情，在一五年把所有的岛上的价格降百分之二十五，然后还要实现正常的供应。So we uh, we there's one thing happened after our getting to that market, the the price it lowered twenty five percent while maintaining the whole countries like the suppliers. 当然，它的电价就从欧盟嗯最高的电价之一降到了欧盟平均以下的水平了。So it has become the country that has the highest price in European Union to the country that is a lower than the average in European Union. 嗯，这个取决于什么？后来我想，取决于技术，取决于管理，也取决于我们今天的主题——公共事业的utility的这个名称。So why it is happening all these changes? I think it because of the because of the technology, because of the management, and also because of one of the themes over here: the utilities, the changes. 我自己理解 utility。从我们过去学英文的时候的utility,可能现在要被重新定义. I think utility, this concept has gone through a big change ever since the years I was in university. 原来的utility是说我取得这个垄断,给你供电,但我承担一个责任,保证你供电,价格有政府审批。before the utility is more like the state-owned company that is supplying the electricity, um, like to ensure it can give you a, a stable electricity with a regulated price. But now more than 75% of the countries uh, has has uh, published like laws that says uh, the final users can choose their providers. And but now those users, they are also going through a lot of changes. Now the users, if in, uh, on top of the roof in their home, they install a solar panel. So not, not only they become the users, they can also become the producer of the electricity. So now, in my understanding, the utility more depends on the services. Uh, 
，过去这两年，大概风电和太阳能又下降了百分之三十的价钱。这种趋势搞到最后，但如果说你就是一个转移者，而没有一个可靠的保证，对 utility 是不负责任的。嗯、uh, ，so for two years, so for two years, the wind, the wind, uh, energy and the solar energy has Uh, the electricity come from those has reduced the price by five percent, and I expect there's going to be a more reduction of thirty percent. 嗯，所以呢，呃，在重新定义以后，我自己呃三周前大概来了次墨西哥，然后感觉墨西哥的政策非常的好。So in three weeks ago, I came to Mexico, and I feel Mexico has a very good policy. 嗯，所以墨西哥在展现发电的同时。对整个 utility 和整个电力工业，从发电、输电、配电，都给予一个非常吸引人的这么一个呃举动，我们感觉非常的兴奋。So、not only in the generation side, but also in the distribution and transmission side, Mexico has given a very good policy to attract. 当然，刚才主持人说中国现在怎么样？呃，我给大家报告，中国过去三十年经济大概连续都在百分之十的增长。So, so, so the moderator has asked, "How is the development here in in China?" So I would like to say the econo economic development in China has boosted like ten percent of the increase every year. Now, over the past thirty years, China's solar energy has become the biggest in the world. Of course, what we feel is that over the past thirty years, because of the increase in the speed of high speed growth, we have developed the technology. 使得我们在信息方面积累了一些经验，当然也有些教训。嗯、呃，我们呢非常愿意呢是贡献一些经验，然后把我们的教训也给大家分享。So with the 30 years of development, China has gone through very high speed of development. So we have gained experiences and we have also gained lessons through this kind of、uh, technology changes. We would like to, we are very happy to share the experience and our lessons. 今天在墨西哥开会。感到非常荣幸，呃，很多的全球的同行都关注墨西哥的市场。墨西哥是现在全球经济增长、电量增长的，呃，国家之一，呃，非常令人羡慕。So we are very honored and happy to be here in today's meeting. Mexico is a country like has, uh, attracted most attention in its energy sector, um, and here we have a have a lot of uh, uh, co. Like workers were working in the same area to share experiences. We are willing to use our experience in the past and our current experience with our colleagues to share the knowledge of the society in Mexico to create the necessary energy and energy to support our strength. Thank you very much. We would be very happy to use our expertise and technology to contribute to the reliable And the clean energy in Mexico. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Yundang Wang, for these insights in China. And I listened carefully to your interest in moving towards a service company. Let's come back to this in a second. Let's address a global picture. And with us is Antonio Babalo from the World Bank. Uh, he's practice manager for energy and extractive global practices here in the Latin American and Caribbean uh, region. He has a long history as a banker in the private bank in Europe, but also now a view from the public development bank as a world bank. How do you see the demand in developing countries in terms of energy structure, energy structural reform, power markets, role of utilities? Um, what ideas does the bank perceive as the most Promising, and to what extent there are regional differences, as already Lawrence mentioned, that one has to look more into detail. Please, Antonio. Good evening, and thank you very much for for this opportunity. Definitely, a quite comprehensive question to to answer. What's happening around the world? The way we address, the way we look at that,、uh, could be quite striking in terms of simplicity, and at the same time. Uh, or how big、uh, the change, the transformational change, could affect us. And、uh, when I was a young engineer, 
I used to, I read the book, The Bill, The Brave New World, and that was quite fascinating. What I learned over a period of time, and in fact, the world, the new brave world, the utilities, or the utility I used to know uh, from uh, Brazil, Electrobras, is now being turned into a new, not a new brave world, but parallel world, worlds. We are living in parallel worlds. And those worlds, worlds are the utilities as we know it, and the new utility as some call it. And perhaps we are talking about something else. And I will structure my ideas in five points. First is a lot, many lessons were learned from the market liberalization that happened in Europe, in North America, and in Chile. And what we saw is making more efficient 100 years old business model. We slice dice called unbundling. We uh, isolate a network business, made it a regulated business, created a commodities business, i.e. power generation, and delivered under two simple markets, wholesale markets and retail markets. And that was called trading. And this a major advance was made during the 90s and, uh, and the 2000s. But the utilities also learn that technology could be in their favor and may not be in their favor. The, the embracement of this idea ha happened uh, primarily in Latin America in the 90s, early 2000s. Many markets reformed the, the, the utilities business or the energy or the elect more precisely, the electricity business. But there was one component that came from quite long time and quite strong in this region and in Southeast Asia. It's called planning, central planning. And what this new world did is central planning is no longer giving certain answers. And because it's not dealing, uh, delivering certain answers, how, what are gonna do about it? And what answers that could be? It was raised here already, resilience. Central planning has not addressed resilience in the way we look. And I can give you simple examples. Either the situation that has been faced in Florida, the year before in Haiti, two years before in Eastern Caribbean, or, and that is quite severe uh, and extreme events, or we can go to Colombia and talk about the long effects that El Nino can cause or a prolonged El Nino. And the implication is simple. No water, no hydropower dam. Simple as that. So we can go to the other side of the world, we can look at in Africa, when they still uh, engage in the first steps of uh, creating utilities or inheriting or perfecting some of the utilities, what we saw is something completely different. Is this parallel world that I'm talking about, it's not regulating the way we understand it, which is primarily found in countries, uh, in areas outside the major cities in Africa. And when we see isolated system poorly, uh, based on renewable energy, we are talking about a microcosmos that we are not paying attention. And those things are happening. It's very common uh, in Kenya, for example, not talking about utility, but talking about paying your bills using your cell phone, which is not an Apple is a Nokia. So you can see that we're talking about something really different happening here. But if I go back to the central planning, not anticipating those technological, uh, technological changes, there are a couple of things that we need to remind ourselves. The first one is we come from a school of resource allocation. When you think about planning, you think about resource allocation, the best resource allocation. And I, I am one of, one of the, the students of, of this, this approach. What you're talking about here is resource adequacy, which now embraces the demand side. Not the consumer, but the customer. This is something that was talked about here today. And when you talk about customer, we connect with the digitalization that was, talk, was talking about, 
as well new technology. No point in discussing how cheap uh, for, uh, photovoltaic plants have become. We go to India and you see a massive engagement on this. Talking about 14 gigawatts a year. 14 gigawatts a year is more than most of the uh, South American countries together. So we're talking about a massive scale of investment having to be interconnected, but still using the old world, the utilities business model. But when you go to the energy efficiency side, we're talking about the new world coexisting in the same country. When they, they look at the focus is smarter cities, or I would say smarter infrastructures in cities, then you're changing the, the paradigm of thinking. And that is what we're the, uh, looking uh, to uh, right now. But when you talk about the, these digitalization new technologies, I used to pick one study that was done by, by the World Bank in Africa three years ago. It's called the power of mine, which means mining companies were using utilities or specific IPPs, still old uh, regime, and making viable developing a grid in areas never been saved before. In Latin America, perhaps you're talking about the uh, mining the power, because when you talk about batteries, we're talking about, for now, lithium. Maybe new technology will be coming pretty soon and replacing that, but for now, we are talking about one of the vast resource of lithium, which can be turned to batteries. But why is this important? Again, I go back to the old business model and the central planning. We thought about storage as something that we put in a reservoir or in a gas, or in a, uh, a gas storage facility or even an oil. That concept is gone. We need to think storage, even hydropower, slightly different or a lot different. That leads to my fourth point, business models. What we had in mind in the past is, as an investor, I see an asset. And this asset, I need like to, to build it. Let's say a power plant. We have a cost, have an idea. Doesn't matter if it's a distributed uh, power plant or if it is a utility scale. Then you think, you go and talk to a lender and uh, I will get the cost of that debt. So as an investor, then I will have the return of my equity. And voila, that's the tariff that I'm going to charge to the regulators. So we'll have some news. This model may not be working in certain countries. Actually, in the vast majority of countries because technology has created a wedge into, into the system, into the regulatory system. We're talking about now, not just uh, utility scale, but small scale, something that was raised today. It's happening. This is the parallel world that some regulators are not paying attention, and it's moving forward. But it's also creating opportunity for utilities, and I'm glad that uh, there are, we have two representatives of quite interesting companies, NG and NNL, because they've adopted a different concept. What is my business? My business is the customer. My business is what the customer needs. What am I good at? I deal with electricity. I'm not dealing only with a battery, a power plant, or a transmission line. I'm dealing with electricity and can, what I can embed electricity into any other needs that a customer may want, i.e. urban mobility. And that's something that we're looking at. And we're debating this. And that leads us to, to uh, my, my final point. Again, across the globe, different answers and uh, nobody with the right answer or the wrong answer. What we're talking about is a new type of financing that is needed and more important, a new regulatory framework to respond not to a one-way power flow, meaning I have a utility scale power plant, am I going to deliver to a consumer or a customer 1,000 miles or 100 kilometers? We're talking about a two-way flow, which means the grid as we know it may be or may become the most important component of this whole physical system. 
and that attracts different types of investors. Somebody raised the idea of millennials. Absolutely, they do exist. But also there are millennial investors. Those ones that use the platforms delivered by ICTs to capture value from the demands of the clients, the customers, and connect with the suppliers. And they are there. So what these parallel worlds that I'm talking about compose four dimensions, physical, commercial, financial, and risk. How are going to be sliced and diced is a story that still needs to be told. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Antonio, also recalling us the combination of centralized and decentralized in many countries, if not all of the world here. I would like now to open the floor for questions or comments from you, the audience. Um, you have to use the micro, otherwise uh, it couldn't be interpreted. Please uh, indicate briefly yourself, your function, and then a brief question. My intention is to gather three or four before then giving it back to the panel. The Hello. sir over there, please. Hello, uh, thank you. My name is David, I'm an energy consultant. And my question would be for the utility companies. How, what are your thoughts on demand response and how are you planning on introducing also IoT into the way that demand response works, especially on the focus being swift, um, shifted from the utilities as a linear system and also into the consumers as generators and bigger players into this energy grid? Thank you very much. Is there a further request? The gentleman over there, please. And then one here in the front. Uh, thank you. Uh, hi, my name is Luis Dario. I'm from the Institute of Renewable Energy. And my question is, what happened after the life of the solar panel or of the, the all renewable energies that you implement, uh, uh, what will happen with the residue? Oh. And that's it all. Thank you. So dismantling of end-of-life PV panels. There was another request for the floor from the gentleman here. Please. Uh, my name is Roberto Carrillo. My question is for Ms. Yorina Grenon. If uh, NG is part of the H2 mobility uh, effort in Europe, in France or, or Germany? Thank you. One last. This nice gentleman over there, and then we get back to the panelists. Yeah, thank Mark. you. I'm Mark Radka with the UN Environment. What, what utilities would like to do also depends on what capital markets will make available in terms of money. Um, and I'd invite any of you to, to just share what, what do the bankers think about the utility of the future? I see Lawrence nodding. That, that looks like a good one. Thank you. Four nice questions. Um, let's start with Georgina and then brief along the panelists here. Georgina, please. Thank you, Martin, and, and thanks for the questions, actually, both uh, that concern me are very interesting. I'll, I'll respond to you very quickly. Um, to start with, our CEO runs a hydrogen car, a Toyota. Uh, so that's a sign, right, <laughs> because she drives it. Um, whether we are part of that particular, I mean, Honestly, I, I don't know, so it's uh, very, very transparent. Truth is, we are working a lot in hydrogen mobility, uh, you know, in trying to make that competitive. Uh, but then we are working in, in other hydrogen schemes that are much, much bigger, uh, you know, and that are going to be a definitely game changers. So we see hydrogen for mobility as one of the many, many uses, possible uses of hydrogen, uh, but there are many others. Uh, of which can actually change, for example, the industry of fertilizers that can change the energy, you know, can use hydrogen as an energy vector, uh, as ammonia, or sort of many other things. So, uh, again, huge potential for some places in the world to become hydrogen producers, you know, green hydrogen producers. So, big believers of hydrogen. Um, then, to the question uh, of um, uh, demand response. The interesting thing for utility is that, you know, we were sort of used to push, you know, electrons, producing electrons and pushing them, right? 
um, being called and then injecting into a, into a system. But now we have the possibility of actually having a demand. And, and this, you know, working with that demand, of, of, of telling that demand when to consume smartly, matching profiles of generation with consumption, you know, making those profiles try to, you know, look as, as, as closer as possible, for example, or not, you know, and, and, and make a business out of that difference, right? So those are very interesting times for, because, you know, utilities are not used to handle the other side. Demand was, was what it was, right? We couldn't do anything with it. We just had to deal with, deal with it. Uh, so now the fact of being able to manage that side, you know, do things with that side, creates a potential for flexibility management, which was inexistent before, right? So again, interesting times for all of us, but I'll probably my, my colleague from NL uh, have, a, have a maybe similar view or? <laughs> Um, a ver, sobre la pregunta de, de demand response, como les decía hace un rato, el enfoque del grupo Enel, que es bastante en línea con lo que se viene hablando, son dos, cliente y digitalización. Y me encantó el comentario de no consumer, no off taker, no son tomadores de energía, son clientes. ¿Por qué hago este comentario? Tan estamos a favor del tema de demand response, que justo acabamos de comprar dos empresas de, de origen estadounidense, bastante grandes, una se llama Demand Energy, then, la otra es Enernoc, que se dedican justo a hacer eso, ¿no? se dedican a poner plataformas para viabilizar Demand Response, para viabilizar eh, el uso inteligente de la energía por parte de los usuarios. Y eso lo tenemos como una forma de empezar a interiorizar todo ese know-how y inyectarnos ese dinamismo eh, y ese nuevo producto como parte de nuestra oferta de valor. Entonces, definitivamente, Demand Response es un tema que requerirá seguramente algunos ajustes regulatorios, requerirá también seguramente un poquito un cambio de mindset de la utility local, eh, porque de repente no es muy proclive a, a ese tipo de cosas, eh, pero, eh, pero de estar allí, estar allí porque de nuevo siempre tener en cuenta, es lo que el cliente quiere hacer, entonces va a pasar. En la medida en la que el cliente quiera gestionarse su propia energía, las cosas van a ocurrir, porque él es el driver del todo. ¿no? Eh, luego quería detenerme un momentito cuando preguntaban sobre qué es lo que opinan los mercados de capital sobre lo que hacemos. Yo creo que no hay que pensarlo únicamente en el, en el, en el approach típico del desarrollo de proyectos, ¿no? el project finance, las grandes infraestructuras… No necesariamente es así. Yo lo respondería de la siguiente manera. Los mercados de capital están teniendo una enorme confianza en el business model que estamos utilizando en Enel. Prueba de ello es la salud financiera de la compañía, como también de, de, de empresas como Engie, ¿no? que están tomando estos rumbos. Eh, en tanto eso siga siendo así y, y sigamos demostrando nuestra capacidad de reaccionar al mercado aun cuando nos demanda cosas tan rápidamente el dinero ahí va a estar, en la medida en la que tengamos la capacidad operativa para reaccionar. No todo tiene que verse con ese approach de business development, ¿no? o sea, de, de, de project development, no, no todas las cosas son así, muy particularmente cuando hablas del servicio al cliente. ¿no? Yo, yo esos son lo, los comentarios principales que tendría. Regarding the question of investors, uh, actually a very good question. Uh, the reactions we've gotten from investors around the world, whether it's in the U.S. or Australia, New Zealand, or even in Europe, is one that is very positive to the transformation, but also very uh, cautious in terms of the kinds of disruption that they're expecting you to do as a utility. So if you look at the U.S. utilities, for example, they're actually involved in everything that's been discussed here, right? I mean, they're involved in uh, EVs. Uh, the majority of the renewables installed in the U.S. are actually utility-scale renewables. Uh, in smart cities, they're making investments. And one way to look at the utility sector is to look at their performance on the stock market. Uh, even during the financial crisis, the only industry where you had stocks constantly growing or constant was the utility sector. What they want, they want regulatory certainty. That's one thing. The other thing they want is they want what I would call managed disruption. 
because if disruption leads to uh, creating other issues for not just their shareholders, but also for the society, there's this repetitional risk. So I think, by and large, they're for the transformation. The utilities are moving forward with making some of these investments, but I think they're also cautious with regards to the reputational risk of the utilities making an investment too far and trying to pull back. So all in all, I think the, the reaction to the stock market for utilities has been a positive one. Uh, uh, 其实事实上面现在能源的这个改变，嗯，金融机构嗯是有不同的看法的。就我的接触。Uh, let me talk about the about the capital capital perspective. 嗯，这个就能源投资啊，金融机构是有不同看法。金融机构它是要确定性。So financial institutions. And with energy organizations, they have different perspectives. Financial institutions want stability. So in the fat,电,电,电,电,电,电,电,电,电,电,电,电,电,电,电,电,电,电,电,电,电,电,电,电,电,电,电,电,电,电,电,电,电,电,电,电,电,电,电,电,电,电,电,电,电,电,电,电,电
Muchos estuvimos encantados de pagar toda esa nueva tecnología, todo el desarrollo hacia esa nueva eh, tecnología, pero lo que no queríamos es pagar los cables que estaban antes o qué iba a pasar con la tecnología de cables y de cobre que aún existe. Y nunca nos cuestionamos de que íbamos a pagar eso, más allá de tener una línea de teléfono que ya ni nadie usa. ¿no? Lo mismo está pasando en electricidad, nadie se va a cuestionar pagar hacia adelante las nuevas tecnologías y el avance tecnológico que vamos. Pero aquí la pregunta regulatoria fundamental va a ser, ¿quién va a pagar esos assets que van a estar y que Lawrence mencionaba para mantener cierta este, eh, 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 confiabilidad del sistema? ¿sí? Aún hay teléfonos fijos y cuando se van los celulares sí los usamos, esos teléfonos fijos, pero rara vez. Pero estamos dispuestos a pagar esa línea en la casa, ¿sí? Entonces, tendrá que haber algún mecanismo regulatorio para financiar o seguir financiando, seguir pagando esa, esa tecnología que no pueda avanzar hacia, hacia, hacia el futuro. Entonces, esa, esa va a ser la, la transformación que hay que ver y que muchos los reguladores van a tener que hacer, que hacer con el viejo modelo, pero no tanto hacia, dónde, hacia adelante, porque eso va a ser claramente financiable. Thank you very much. We have to come to an end and I would like to ask a last question to the panelists here. One, just one quick question. Um, we have heard about different business models, centralized utilities, new market entrants, competition, um, startups even, venture capital that goes into the sector so it's not a shortage of money or capital, it's called the question of the relation of, of risks at various moments. Imagine 10 years ahead of us, Do we have a utility that is limited to the physical infrastructure that Lawrence was referring to? Do we have an entity that provides a service, as uh, Mr. Yang Zhong Wong was referring to, incorporating demand side response? Or do we have a fully digitally laced world with blockchain technologies where the different ethical devices communicate among themselves and we don't have any intermediate, physical, human, or whatever technical actor there. What do you see as the most likely business model for typical utilities in 10 years, and what is your specific way to go there where you see your business in 10 years? Georgina, you are a big utility representative. What a question. <laughs> um, truth, the three models, the three of them, Uh, there's just room for the three of them to have a, you know, a say in this game, especially in 10, 10 years down the road. The physical business, I mean, as long as we don't you know, manage to travel electricity wireless, I mean, we need the cables, and this was said before. So, you know, we just need to find the right way to support, as you were saying, the security of supply. Because it's not the cables, it's, it's the right of actually having the electricity when you need it, you know, and, and, and having it all the time and how much you're able to pay to secure the fact of still having it even when the sun doesn't shine or the wind doesn't blow, right? Um, the virtual power plant, you know, the other extreme, not a single asset, it's all virtual. Yeah, there's room for that, and, then, and more and more so. You know, and then something sort of in between, a mix of some assets with some virtual, definitely there. I mean, so. I think the three models are going to live together um, in some places of the world, maybe more of one than the other. Uh, it will all depends on, on, on the regulatory structure, on the business, on the client's needs, right? What they want to, what they are eager to pay for, uh, what governments are, are eager to, uh, to take as risks as well. Um, you know, so we're going to see a mix of those three in different geographies. That's my take. I agree. <laughs> well, I would say, I, actually, we, you said 10 years from now, we actually already see all three models existing, uh, right? I mean, you, in New Zealand, there's a company there, uh, utility that is doing blockchain. Uh, in Australia and even the U.S., you have utilities that are doing the service-based models and you have Europe. I think the question I would ask uh, in, you know, in, in regards sort of a, to your question would be, what would society want in 10 years? Because it all boils down to society. And one of the things we do a lot, and I, I worked for Alstom in the past, I've been around technology for a long time, and we always find technology and start looking for a problem. So we take a disruptive technology from one sector and we bring it to the energy sector and we start looking for a problem to solve. 
but we never stop and ask the question, what does society want? And I think the real question we need to ask ourselves here is, I know the millennials, I'm kind of a quasi-millennial myself, so I would put myself somewhere there. But you remember, the vast majority of the population are not millennials, even though millennials will make a big impact. So when we think of the elder in society, when we think of the less fortunate in society, where do this fit into this equation? Because the equation so far is about the well-off, those who can afford. But those who cannot afford, who are gaining more popularity, if we don't think about them, 10 years from now, you can have all your nice business models you want. When you have a, million, a billion people who don't have access to electricity in your country, your business model makes no sense. So for me, my concern is who thinks about the less fortunate and they're growing in number. I'm not concerned about the well-off. I believe all of you are right. <laughs> Don't need to add too much. What I, I can see as well is the investors or the number of investors as we see in, in utilities today will change. It will change because there will be new services, there will be new types, there will be new obligations. What Lawrence raised is a true fact uh, in, in countries that we work. We need to think about those ones that do not have access. So how do we make that asset? access function at affordable uh, prices, sustainable in a long run, resilient. So these questions will not get away. They will be there for a long time. But the number of investors, the type of investors influencing the utilities business will change. Lo que a mí me quita el sueño es pensar si realmente este modelo Eh, que a final de cuentas aterriza en personas, que es de, el utility verticalmente integrado, va a poder transformarse porque las, fer, las personas que lo operan pueden a su vez transformarse. Al final de cuentas son personas quienes operan, las empresas son personas. Y, y si tenemos la capacidad como operadores de las utilities, como líderes de estas utilities, tener la capacidad de entender el nueva, la nueva realidad y transformarse correspondientemente a esa nueva realidad y en el tiempo que se requiere. No es, una, es un tema de visión, sino también de oportunidad de la transformación. Y eso aquí en México es algo que a mí me preocupa. Si la reforma energética ha cambiado leyes, constituciones, reglamentos, incluso ha, ha creado todo un, un desarrollo institucional a, alrededor de eso, si eso está permeando también en las gentes que requieren transformarse y transformar estas instituciones para responder a esa nueva realidad. Si no somos capaces de que estos líderes puedan, de estos ejecutivos, de estos operadores puedan transformar esas instituciones, vamos a estar en problemas, no de aquí a 10 años, en dos años, en tres años, en el muy corto plazo. Y eso es algo que sí me preocupa. Yo coincido con la misma preocupación. Soy optimista porque la empresa de nosotros es una prueba viviente de que eso puede hacerse. No éramos muy distintos de la CFE apenas hace 20 años. Eh, ahora, contestando en eh, 10 años, coincido, existirán los tres modelos y de hecho habrá compañías como Enel, en los que, que tendrá los tres modelos distintos simultáneamente en distintas geografías, porque se requerirá. Hablaban del tema, y yo lo comparto plenamente, de la accesibilidad a la energía eléctrica, en quién piensa en el bottom of the pyramid. ¿no? Eso es súper importante y por ejemplo allí, el modelo Full Integrated Utility Scale funciona perfectamente en mis sistemas microgrid o off-grid. Y eso también es un, uh, suena un poco raro decirlo, pero es un mercado potencial gigantesco con enormes oportunidades, no solo de desarrollo social, sino también de negocio. Entonces, es muy probable que, y no, de hecho nosotros ya lo estamos haciendo en África, ¿no? es algo que también hacemos. En algún punto coexistirán los tres modelos distintos dentro de nuestra propia empresa, por ejemplo. Ese modelo totalmente integrado, cuando hagamos proyectos en ese tipo de, en ese tipo de situaciones, el modelo totalmente digital, eh, eh, en los mercados mucho más desarrollados y esquemas bastante híbridos en, en, en países como el nuestro. Entonces, yo, yo creo que existirán los tres y coincido, para que esto funcione maravillosamente, 
hay que hacer un esfuerzo y un apoyo enorme a, a, a la compañía local para esa transformación filosófica. Thank you very much for these very insightful um, responses. Uh, I think uh, you gave us a picture of a very evolving, even if not in a revolutionary phase uh, sector here, with new, not only technologies, but also business models, and in the end, what will be the customer look like and request in 10 years from now. I would love to be again here in 10 years and <laughs> share the experience that we have seen since then. Um, just one housekeeping um, announcement. The cultural event that will start at 7 o'clock with the ballot will just take place in the plenary room here, behind this room here. Now, to conclude, I would like to ask you to hand in and a warm applause for this fantastic panel that made my task so easy. Thank you very much. And also thank you very much for you, the very active audience. Good evening.